Hey you! Yes you! You want to learn how to make panoramic 360 videos in SFM? Because I mean, if not, why did you click this video? Well either way, I'm here to teach you how to do it the way I did. There may be better ways to do this, but this is how I did it. This seriously took a lot of work and math, so I hope you guys appreciate it. Before we actually get started, I'm going to tell you about something that may help you understand what you're doing and why. Cube mapping. You may have heard this term before. You may have even heard of my patented limited edition one-of-a-kind custom cube map pack for Source Filmmaker by Logan McLeod. A subsidiary of Logan McLeod Media. Anyway, a cube map works by plastering textures onto the inside of a cube. This technology is what allows for distant, cheap skyboxes. In fact, that's why it's called a skybox. It's just a box with a picture of the sky on it. To keep skyboxes from looking boxy, perspective is taken into consideration for each box face. Most skyboxes and cube maps are actually pre-rendered in 3D using a square camera with a 90 degree field of view. Hopefully, this will have started to click with some of you. If not, just sit back and hopefully this will all make sense as we go on. Now, the software we will be using won't actually be Source Filmmaker alone. But first, you will need Source Filmmaker. And after that, you will also need video editing software capable of importing image sequences and being able to output bizarre custom resolutions. For this tutorial, I will be using Adobe Premiere Pro Creative Cloud. And finally, you will be needing stitching software of some kind. Okay, that's a little steep. Well, if you're poor, like me, we'll be using Blender instead. Blender 2.76 or higher to be exact. Alright, let's get started. Now get the gum out of your ears and listen good. Launch Source Filmmaker and load up the map of your choice. When selecting a map, be very careful of procedural textures. To put it in layman's terms, procedural textures are textures that move on their own. Like if you're looking around with the work camera and the texture is animated, yeah, try to avoid that as much as you can. If you really, really, really want to have a procedural texture in your shot, try to keep it inside the view of only one camera. Procedural textures vary slightly from render to render, and we can't have that because we're going to be doing not one, not two, but six renders. <laughs> now, calm down, calm down, try not to panic. It's not that bad. My own demo video was only 1080p for most of it, and I had ambient occlusion and depth of field turned off. The source videos were only 720p, because that's all it needed to be for a 1080p panoramic video. However, if you plan on upping the resolution and doing a 4K panoramic video, which if you want a clearer picture, you should, I would render your source videos in 1080p or higher with higher quality settings. Now, let's set up our cameras. First, create a camera. Good. Now, move it to about the position you want it to be. Now, open up the camera settings and go into the transform settings. Make sure you're in the motion editor. Okay, so in your um, animation box thing, double click transform rot which stores the information for the camera's rotation, not how moldy it is. <laughs> that was a joke. Three random numbers will come up. Because of the nature of Panorama, we need exact numbers. So we will be changing these numbers, but one at a time. For some reason, if you change more than one at a time, weird stuff can happen and your camera becomes useless. I don't really know why this happens. The first number we are going to change is the rightmost number. Change it to zero and click somewhere else to set the value. And the camera should adjust slightly unless it was already zero. Now double click again and... Wait a minute... That's not zero? This random number actually does mean zero. My theory as to why it's so random is because Source Filmmaker uses Quan... Quatern... Not standard Euler rotation. What do those terms mean? I don't know! Something about avoiding gimbal lock. Look, what I'm trying to say is it's fine, okay? Don't worry about it. It's all good, just leave it alone. Now change the middle number to zero. Again, to set it, click somewhere else. Preferably anywhere but here, so you don't accidentally move the camera and ruin everything you've worked so hard to achieve. 
The final and leftmost number usually doesn't change that much, but just to be safe, let's double click the rotation again and set that final number to zero. Your camera should now be facing perfectly along a grid. If it's doing this, you fucked up. Try again. Now we're going to change the field of view. Those of you who jumped ahead thinking you had this figured out are probably coming back here wondering how you managed to screw up so bad. You might have been thinking, yeah, change the camera field of view to 90 degrees, right? Piece of cake. We got this figured out. Wrong. See, inexplicably, this number means diddly squat when it comes to actual field of view. So after a lot of effort and math, I figured out the real number you need. No need to thank me. Right click on the field of view slider and click remap slider range. Change the max value to 106.25. That's right, 106.25. You got that? You're tuned in to Logan McLeod Radio, 106.25. Good. Now click OK and turn that slider all the way up. Congratulations, you set up your front camera! This is the camera that will be the default view in panoramic videos. So this will be the view you may want to have your main or initial focus. Upon hearing this information, you might be thinking, wait a minute, but if this is the main view, I want the camera to point this way. Don't worry, we'll get to that. In the meantime, don't touch anything. Now copy your camera and paste it. Again, do not move it. You can drag the camera into the viewport though to see what it looks like and to make sure you don't fuck up. For this camera, double click the rotation transforms and as you can see you'll have a garbled mess of numbers. However, only change the rightmost number. Change it to 90. Like I mentioned before, these aren't exact numbers but representations. Just let them do their job and you do yours. Click elsewhere and your view should have rotated 90 degrees to the left. This will be your left camera. Now paste the camera again and change the rightmost number to 180. This will be your back camera. I know I've said this already, but it's crucial to the basic functionality of this concept. Do not move your cameras. You will get ugly seams, I can't stress this enough. If you're afraid of moving the camera when you drag it into the viewport, just make sure you're in the clip editor. Then switch back to the motion editor when you put the numbers in. Now paste the camera again, and change the rightmost number to negative 90. This will be your right camera. Now paste the first camera again. This time we won't be changing the rightmost number, but the middle number. Change the middle number to 90. This will be your bottom camera. Just one more camera to go. Paste the camera and change the middle number to negative 90. This will be your top camera. You now have your box array set up. But now what? As you know, you're not allowed to move these cameras because I said so. So how do you move them? Like this. Spawn a small prop of some kind. I use a beer bottle because this whole process makes me feel like drinking. Open the children of the front camera and the beer bottle until you see transform in the camera animation set and root transform in the bottle prop. Lock the beer transform to the camera by dragging the transform option over the root transform option. Select root transform and go into the procedural sliders. Slide zero all the way to the right. Now unlock it. We will now lock the cameras to the beer bottle by dragging the root transform into the camera transform. Unlike with the beer bottle, do not use the zero slider. We used the zero slider on the beer to change its position and rotation, and we do not want to do that with the cameras. Once they're all locked, uncheck the selectable icon from cameras, and uncheck the visible icon from the beer bottle. You can now move the root transform of the beer bottle without worrying about misaligning your camera array. Use the graph editor to move the camera array around. As a tip, try to avoid rotating the view too much as the viewer will be able to look around for themselves. So animate something or do whatever you want. Remember to avoid procedural textures. Try to avoid animated particles as well unless you can scrub back and forth in time and it always animates the same way. 
Remember, any setting you apply to one camera, such as Bloom, which I would turn off by the way, you need to apply that exact same setting to the other cameras, otherwise you'll get seams. <sighs> that was a lot of information. So get animating. I'm gonna grab a sandwich. I'll be right back. What am I doing? Let me just pause this video. I don't need to eat a sandwich. So now you've got your beautiful 360 video animation ready to render. Now, let's get to render settings. If you're going to make a low quality 1080p video like I did, 720p should be fine. 1080p for a panorama is the flat equivalent of a 480p video because it stretches it out. If you're making this a high quality 4K panorama, then I would up your settings to 1080p or higher if you're so bold. Now make a new folder for your video. Name the video after the camera you're rendering. If you're rendering the front camera, name it front, left is left, back is back, etc. Make sure your settings are image sequence and PNG. Make sure you have plenty of room on your hard drive for the number of files. The higher your frame rate, the more images will be rendered and the more space will be taken up. And remember, that whatever you're rendering will be multiplied by 6, so a 4 minute video will actually have about 24 minutes worth of footage. Okay, now get to rendering. Do something else like go outside or watch Netflix or something. Check back regularly so you can change the camera and render the new view when a render finishes. Did you do it? You rendered all 6 videos? Great! Now you're actually done with Source Filmmaker! Open up your video editor. Like I mentioned, I'll be using Premiere Pro Creative Cloud because it can import image sequences and can output weird formats. Make sure your media settings are set up properly. So if you have a 24 FPS animation, you'll want to change this to 24 FPS. 60 to 60, you get the idea. Import your six image sequences and drag one onto the timeline to activate the sequence. Now take it back off again. We are going to change the sequence settings to have a square aspect ratio. So if you have a 720p video, you'll change that number to 720 by 720. 1080p, you'll change it to 1080 by 1080, you get the idea. Now drag one of the image sequences onto the timeline again. You'll get a message about changing the settings. Click Keep Existing Settings. Bam! It is now perfectly cropped. Now we're going to be exporting these sequences individually now that they're cropped. But instead of exporting them as image sequence, we'll export them as uncompressed AVI. Put them into a folder on your desktop or somewhere easy to access. Now open up Blender. There's a complicated process of setting up the cube, the shaders, blah blah blah. Fortunately, I've already done the settings for you. You're welcome. The link to the Blend file is in the description. Open the file in Blender 2.76 and follow these instructions. You should know how many frames are in your image sequence. If you're not sure, go back into Premiere and check by changing the time code to frames and putting the time needle at the end of the sequence. Keep the number displayed in mind. Now go back into Blender. In the Render tab, scroll down to Frame Range and change the end frame to the number you saw in Premiere. Also change your frame rate to whatever your frame rate is. By default, I have it set to 60. But if you export a 24 FPS, change that number to 24 etc. Click the cube and go into the materials tab. I already have six materials named for you. Go to the material labeled top. Under image texture, click the folder icon and find your AVI labeled top. And under these extra settings, change frames to the number we mentioned earlier. Repeat this process for all six sides. Double check you put the frame number on each side otherwise that side will remain static and will ruin this render. If you have a high quality graphics card like an NVIDIA graphics card, change this render setting to GPU. Otherwise, keep it on CPU. By default, I have the resolution at 1080p. To increase the resolution to 4K, change the numbers to 3840 by 2160. By default, I have this rendering to a PNG image sequence and I would recommend you keep it that way. In the output section, Click the folder icon and change the folder to where you want to output it. Since it's an image sequence, I would recommend making a new folder. 
Once you're ready, click the animation button. This will vary from computer to computer, but for me this was always the longest render, so be prepared to wait a long time for this. Are... are we done? Great! The hard parts are over! Now bring the new image sequence into your favorite video editor and do what you want with it. Avoid text overlays though, as those will look strange in the video. Render the text in Blender or SFM instead and then overlay it. I recommend getting a panoramic video player in order to preview it. I use Colorize. This player is free, don't worry. So you finished the video, you're all set, you've exported and you're ready to upload. Well, almost. First we need to inject metadata into the file using some special software. A link to it is in the description below. Simply open the file inside the program and check Spherical. Do not check 3D, that's something else. Save the file and the new file is what you upload. Click the video process and it should work just fine. And that's a wrap! Congratulations! You've made your very own panoramic video using Source Filmmaker! If you have any questions, leave me a comment or an ask on my animation blog. Thanks for watching! If this video was helpful, leave me a like or share this video with other people you think would want to make panoramic videos in Source Filmmaker. If you like animation, or other technically impressive videos like this, consider subscribing to my channel. Well, that's all for now. See you later.